Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach. And this is Dadvice TV Live. Now, if you're new, welcome. Go ahead and introduce yourself down in the comments. Let us know where you're from. What stage are you? You'll find that we have an awesome community here at Dadvice TV. They're very positive, supportive, and helpful. And for those of you that are new, let me quickly introduce myself. My name's James. I am a kidney patient. I was diagnosed just about almost two and a half years ago with stage five kidney failure. Mm -mm -mm. They wanted to put dialysis in me, get me started right away. But I said, hold on, doctor. Can we wait? Can I try a few things? And I was healthy enough that they let me try a few things while well, they kept a very close eye on my labs. Well, I worked on eating better, worked with a renal dietitian. I worked with everybody on my healthcare team, get my blood pressure under control. I started exercising. I even lost a lot of weight and my overall health improved. Along with that, my labs for my kidneys also got much better. Not great, but much better. Today, I'm stage three, but more importantly, I don't have any symptoms. Kidney disease is not holding me back from doing anything. I want to do. Now tonight, we have an interesting topic. We're going to talk about kind of what happened to me when I was in the hospital, emergency dialysis. Now luckily, my situation wasn't as severe to where they absolutely had to do dialysis starting right then and there. But we're going to talk about what happens if you're in the hospital and they need to start dialysis now. Not next week, not next month, not in the future, but now. And to talk about that, we have back again from down in Texas where it was really cold for a while. You guys were all over the news, all you down in Texas, but I hear it's warmed up and it's doing much better down there. We have with us Dr. Cossum, but hey doc, how you doing? How's it going guys? What's up? Hey, for those that are new, tell them about yourself so they know you're a real doctor and that what you say is really important. <laughs> well, I'm Dr. Costum, but I'm an interventional nephrologist from San Antonio, Texas. Um, I've been on the show numerous times and I love coming on here, but I am uh, pretty active on social media, guys. So if you guys are out there, please like my like my page and like my channel, Your Kidneys, Your Health. What I do is I create video content that's under video content that's understandable and fun and engaging for patients. Their videos are short, three to five minutes, but I get to the point and the heart of the matter, the questions that you guys have at hand, I try to answer them in, in, in a way that you you understand not using big words so if you guys got some got a chance after this like me on facebook cost about md and um your kidneys your health on youtube instagram linkedin please help me out and do that yeah and dr butts videos are awesome unlike most of those doctors you go on youtube and you get them they're just sitting there reading a powerpoint with all sorts of medical terms on it using big giant words and we're sitting here yeah. as patients thinking what the heck are they talking about what does it mean <laughs> Dr. Butt brings humor, style, some pizzazz, and keeps it easy. Ooh, and focuses, <laughs> yeah, just what you need. Uh, it's funny watching your intro, all the different things you're wearing, the hats, you're doing things, you're talking about diabetes, you got ice cream, and yeah. all, all that stuff. <laughs> well, I, I don't see why education can't be fun and education about your health can't be fun. And so if you don't make it fun or engaging, people are not going to want to take it seriously. So that's the way I've always looked at it. So, yep. And that's kind of my take on life. You know, I love, you know, you can only control so much. So I take life with a little bit of humor. I try to inject humor and a little bit of, you know, like, ah, reality, you know, let go of the stress. And I feel that really helps with learning things, dealing mm -hmm. with the unexpected and just kind of, you know, not getting as stressed out. Yeah. And, you know, that's part of the topic we're going to talk about today is mm -hmm. emergency dialysis. That's one of those things that's unexpected. Yeah, that's a... And by everyone joining us tonight, you guys are going to learn about it. So if, oh, if it happens to you to where you need emergency dialysis, you're going to be better prepared because you're going to know more about it. So let's start mm -hmm. off, Doc. What the heck is emergency dialysis and what's the difference between that and urgent dialysis? Okay, so um, 
you would you you when you were you use the word emergency but it'd be emergent so you'd say dialysis for a patient is either needed routine it's needed urgent or it's needed emergent okay emergency right so what that means is routine means you need just need dialysis on your routine schedule if you're monday wednesday friday dialysis you just need to go on your routine schedule urgent means you need it probably the next few hours um because or next few days because you know your situation's deteriorating a little bit so it's pretty urgent emergent is something what we call stat meaning like you need to do it now or you can die in the next few few minutes or hours um so there's different qualifications there and what uh, for you to need it uh emergent or emergency dialysis and those are a e i o u okay you ready for those james a e i o u hey, i'm ready you're bringing you ready? me back to school when i was younger okay A-E-I-O-U. okay you ready <laughs> i'm ready okay the reasons for that this could be for both people that are on dialysis and not on dialysis so it could be for both so you needing emergency dialysis like when you went to the hospital you were not a dialysis patient but you needed emergent di- or may right. needed i was just emergent a patient who thought i had food poisoning and ended up yeah, going in yeah. there with all these problems and it wasn't yeah. until they took labs and some mm-hmm. doctor with a big long name nephrologist Shows up in my room mm-hmm. saying renal failure, renal this, dialysis, like, whoa. Yeah. yeah. So let's just go over them. And, you know, you may have met some of these criteria. That's why they offered them for you, okay? So A. A is acidosis, okay? Acidosis. Acid. So if you guys remember from high school uh, chemistry, right? You have acid and base. Acid and base, right? Your pH balance, right? Yeah. So... Uh, so your, if your pH balance is off and you're leaning towards very acidotic, meaning you have a lot of acid buildup, that's an indication to do emergent dialysis. Okay. One I had indication. that one. I'm going to check it off. Okay. See how okay. many of these I had. E, electrolyte abnormalities, electrolyte abnormalities, particularly high potassium. I think you had that too, right? No, mine was no? the opposite. Mine was extremely was low. low. They gave me bags of potassium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You hadn't been eating though for a while, too. Right, right? I had not. I right? barely eaten so for you maybe two it, weeks. Yeah. Just crackers yeah, so and sports eat. drinks. That was about it. Yeah. So, but high potassium is one that is another indication to start. So, electrolyte abnormalities, high potassium, because high potassium can actually kill you. For those of you guys out there that know, and you guys are on dialysis, many of y'all don't take high potassium seriously. And I'll tell you one reason you should. The way they execute prisoners in prisons when they do an injection, lethal injection, they inject them with high doses of potassium. So, high doses of potassium can put your heart into what we call an arrhythmia. So, your heart has a certain rhythm. And if that potassium's off, the potassium messes up the electrical signals within the heart and throws that into you into an arrhythmia and you die. So high potassium is another indication to start uh, dialysis. Okay. Got okay. It. Um, what else? Was that I? I. Okay. I don't know why I did this. I, I guess it's an I. You know. It's an I. Uh, I. All right. I. So intoxications. So certain medications you take or certain drugs you ingest that you're intoxicated with, say you have high levels of it, say it's not like in a suicide attempt, right? Oh, okay. You can actually require dialysis to clean it out of your blood. Oh, Do you see what I'm that saying? That makes sense. All right, I did not yeah, have so intoxications. I, and one of I the interesting even, ones is- I couldn't even take my blood pressure medication and keep it down for about two weeks. So I had yeah, but there's no some, medication yeah. in me except Tums well, there's some and people, Pepto. Some people- some people overdose on medications. Some do or purposely when they're doing suicide. Uh, for instance, like um, one of the indications is when if you drink, uh, uh, oh my God, uh, coolant, like, um, you know, freezer. Uh, antifreeze? What's it called? In your car. Antifreeze, yeah, antifreeze. Yep. So if you if people use that to commit suicide. And oh. if they do, and I've actually done that before, by the way, done dialysis emergently on patients to get the antifreeze out of their system. So oh. that's one indication. So another thing is intoxications with certain medications, certain drugs, certain chemicals that dialysis can actually remove from the system. Again, those are not chronic dialysis patients. Those are emergents, right? So what was the other one? A-E-I-O. Okay, you guys ready for this one? Because a lot of you all may have this. Overload. And when we talk about overload, we mean fluid overload, okay? So fluid mm. overload. So what that means is you, 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 a lot of you all out there that have kidney issues, you oftentimes probably get swollen, right? Mm-hmm. Really swollen in the legs. Um, you get swollen, you get sometimes get, and sometimes you get short of breath too, right guys? You guys are out there oh, probably yeah. have shortness of breath. I had the shortest of breath. Down. I had the gigantic 
cankles, my legs just went straight down into my feet and my shoes wouldn't even fit. They were so swollen. Yeah, so that's that's another indication to start dialysis, okay? That's another indication. That's A-E-I-O, um, that's overload. And then last one is U, A-E-I-O-U, uremia, uremia. So uremia, okay, you guys have probably known about your labs, your B-U-N. When your B-U-N mm-hmm. goes high, you can become uremic. And what that means is the B-U-N is reflective of the toxic buildup in your bloodstream, right? So after a certain point, you build up all these toxins. And what's weird is, James... Our bodies are so resilient that you actually get used to those hot level of toxins. Even those people with CKD4 and 5, not on dialysis, they get used to a BUN of like 80, 90, 100, and they're fine. Yep. At a certain point, though, the, the BUN, BUN gets high enough to where they crash, meaning it just puts them over the edge and they become uremic. And what uremic means is those toxins have built up to the point where they either feel weak, tired, fatigued, um, nauseous. They have funny ta- food oh taste funny. Yes, they have a the metallic, metallic taste. In their mouth. Some confusion, people even get is confused. Is that part of it? Because I was, yes. Confusion. It yeah. was so hard to concentrate. Oh. Yeah. So if any of those things I just mentioned, the AEIOUs, cannot be addressed medically, meaning by giving you medications and improving you medically, like so you can show up in the ER with high potassium, guys. You can, and they can give you medication to bring it down. But sometimes these these conditions I just mentioned or the combination of these conditions do not resolve medically with medications and dialysis has to be given emergently. Okay. And that's for both people with acute, uh, with red normal kidneys that had kidney injury or had these problems uh, and those that have kidney disease that is progressing down and they need dialysis. So those are, those are the reasons why you would need emergent dialysis. Now, would I have a, would my GFR be in the single digits with those problems, I mine was an eight originally. <clears throat> not and they necessarily. Got so not as, okay. So not necessarily. So I want you to understand. So like um, intoxications, right, dude? Like, so if you had intoxications with it, you just try to commit suicide. Your kidney function may be fine, but if you just try to commit suicide with antifreeze, your kidney yeah, you function. Gotta is fine. You, you gotta get it out. Yeah, yeah, I get it out. Right. Um, same thing with acid levels. Your kidney function may be good, but you may have ingested a drug or what we call get se- what we call septic, where is where a lot of where you get a really bad infection and a lot of acid build up in your blood. Your kidneys may be working to a decent amount, but you just need the the, the dialysis to assist with that. Um, yeah. Even like with uh, what we call fluid overload, right? So your kidneys may be working to some degree, but if you have too much fluid on you and it's the medications, uh, the diuretics aren't working. Um, we may need to do dialysis to remove that fluid. And so the, these are all indications of why we would need to do dialysis emergently, urgently, right then and there. And so that's how, that's how we would go about it. Interesting. So I, I qualified yeah. for three of those. My BON was skyrocketed. Uh, the mm-hmm. A I had, the O I had. <laughs> um, those are the only two. Um, yeah, but I was in bad shape. Oh, oh. I never want to yeah. get to that point again. Now, what? So say I need it now. I'm in the emergency room. They're going to install mm-hmm. an access. Now for me, they wanted to do it in the neck. Um, uh, yep. are there options or is that where they do it when it's, so this okay. is the thing. So most people, most people, when they're going to do emergent dial- dialysis, they're going to do hemodialysis. Again, guys, hemo means blood. So hemodialysis is the blood dialysis. There is something called urgent start peritoneal dialysis. Y'all have heard of PD, peritoneal dialysis. We've mm-hmm. talked about that, James, where they do flu- fluid in the abdomen as well, too. That can be done, but not every hospital does that. Not every nephrologist does that. So I want to say over 90% of the time, if you need dialysis urgently, it's going to be hemodialysis. So they have to put a catheter in your neck, a tube in mm-hmm. your neck. Okay. And that tube is going to come out. And I brought that on the show. The, remember I brought those before? The, 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 those things are the giant. <laughs> They're not yeah, small. Yeah. So the, it's got two prongs at it. It's going to stick out right probably here in your neck area or down here. It's going to, it's going to be right there. So um, it's it, it's going to be there. It's going to be temporarily uh, temporarily put there. Now, um, when you start emergent dialysis, just so you guys know. And now let's just say um, it's a, it's acute, meaning it's all the problems that suddenly happened. You're not a dialysis patient from the long port. They can actually do dialysis for a few days, clean out your blood, and then kind of see how you stabilize out. 
Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's good. It's going to take some time to see. It's like because some people just show up in the ER. They have very very poor medical follow up. Either they they don't go or they can't afford it. Whatever the reason, they don't go and they show up in the ER sick as a dog and we don't know anything about them. We do a dialysis for a few days. And guys, remember, I want you guys to remember one thing, a uh, uh, serious thing. Dialysis by no means fixes the kidneys. It merely replaces the kidneys and does the work of the kidneys until the kidneys fix themselves. So there's no real medication we give to fix the kidneys. Now we can adjust some things and give proper fluids and proper things like that. But the dialysis by no means fixes the kidneys. It takes the role of the kidneys until the kidneys wake up on their own. So we wait a few days to see if the electrolytes are okay, the toxin is out, the fluid situation is okay. And then we wait a few days and see does the creatinine kind of level off the gfr kind of level off at a certain acceptable range to where hey they don't need dialysis anymore do you see what i'm saying yep now um abby asked a question a good one um of those aeiou symptoms or, or, or or problems do you need just one of those for if it's bad enough to kind of get started it, or it depends it- like intoxications dude if you're and you're talking all the other stuff is okay they're gonna do it right yeah. um it's usually a, a bit let's say outside the realm of intoxication it's usually a a, a uh it's usually a decision of, uh like a compound not compound but a multi-factor decision so um, yeah, we would take multiple things. Okay. So if your potassium sky high, your acid levels are really high, your fluid situations off, I'm probably going to start dialysis on you. You see what I'm saying? Cause that's too yep. difficult to manage medically. Um, so maybe dialysis is earned. So it's usually a combination. It's usually not one thing. Uh, it's not one thing right off the bat. It's usually a combination of, of several things uh, along with the kidney, kidney function that we take into account to start the dialysis. Yep. So if, if I'm taken into the ER and they're like, okay, mm-hmm. We got to start dialysis. How soon am I hooked up to a machine? You know, they've got to install that port and yeah. go through all that so, process. So the port, like, so I'm actually an interventional nephrologist, so I actually put those catheters in. Now, typically, I do them in the, what they call outpatient setting. So if you're stable and you need to start dialysis, I, you come to me, I put the catheter in, you start the dialysis the next day kind of thing. I can do them in the hospital, too, but typically what happens is you show up to the ER sick as a dog with those symptoms, the AEIOUs. The ER doctor may put it in, or they may get what we call the interventional radiologist to put it in, and they'll put it in, in, the, in the ER. Again, with the, the way they do it, They clean off this area. Let me just show you how you got to do it, guys. They clean off this area really nice and clean. They cover it all up, just exposing this part of the neck. And then um, they actually use an ultrasound to find that vein. It's called the internal jugular vein. They take a lidocaine needle right here, numb it up locally, and then they put another needle in into the vein, pass a wire, and over that wire, they pass the tube down. So it's it's a process, and it probably takes me... Uh, depending on the catheter, five to 10 minutes, uh, the, if a simple catheter, which is a non-tunnel catheter, which is a temporary catheter, but uh, the bigger catheters, the permacats, the ones that are for chronic dialysis patients that come out in the chest, that'll take me like 20 minutes or so. So it depends on the, um, it depends on the person, um, but that's how they typically will start the dialysis is urgently in the ER or with the ra- radiologist putting it in. So there's no waiting for it to heal or giving it 24 hours or anything. They're just, you're installing it and then boom, they're hooking it up and going. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, they're going to have to do a chest x-ray afterwards. So after we put that catheter in, they have to see if the placement is okay. So that catheter Mm -hmm. tube is coming down and sits right in the middle of your heart area, by the way. So um, they want to make sure the positioning is proper, that it works properly. And then... You know, if it's stat, like we stat again, the terminology is stat. If you guys watch any of our medical shows, you know, yep, stat yeah, means that, within two that hours. That's where we all know. Yeah, so stat means when we get an order stat, it means within two hours it needs to be done. Do you see what I'm saying? Yep. So it, if a stat a stat dialysis means you got to get that uh, and get it in right now. Now, um, now it doesn't mean everyone's going to get it within two hours. You know, like it depends on how busy the hospital is and it depends on how sick you are. Um, again, like. Uh, it's, it's, if it's a combination of things and you're relatively stable, they may need to do very urgent emergent dialysis, but it may take a few hours for everything to get processed and you get on the machine. So it really depends. Yep. And, and mind furry has a great question and thank you for the super chat. Um, they donated four ninety nine. Yay! Yeah. It's awesome. Oh, great. Okay. Wow. Um, they went to the ER in January with a, a GFR of 13 and two nephrologists didn't want to start dialysis, even though they felt horrible, they wanted to wait until they were single digits. Do you have a, do you know why they would want to do that? 
So, um, so guys, like, so typically dialysis is initiated fifteen at fifteen percent or less, right? A GFR of fifteen or less, typically around there. But it, everyone's different. So I've started people on dialysis with GFRs of uh, of eight, and I've started people with GFRs of eighteen. It depends on their overall symptoms and how they're feeling and how they're doing. So mm-hmm. GFR is kind of a uh, GFR is kind of a uh, fifteen is kind of an average and kind of like how we think it is. Um, it, it, it depends on those nephrologists. Now, I'm not the, those nephrologists, okay? But I don't know why you felt like crap. You may have had a GFR of 13, but in clinic, you had a GFR of 13, 14, 15, so it's about the same, and maybe you felt like crap because you were in there for pneumonia or, you know, you had the flu. You see what I'm saying? So there could have been other reasons you felt like crap because you could have other disease processes going on that, that there. So, I, I, you know, a lot of us are conservative about starting dialysis as long as possible. And the reason why is we want to give you a good life, right? We don't want you yeah. living the dialysis life. So if I can give you an extra month, two, three, four, five, six months without having dialysis, I'm not going to just arbitrarily say GFR 15, you start dialysis. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Now I've noticed that some, you know, medicine is an art guys. It's an art. So it's, it's, it's subjective. So some di- nephrologists are more particular about when they start, um, maybe start earlier. Um, I happen to start later on the chronic side, meaning the people that I see in clinic, I'll just follow them every month or so, keeping them off dialysis as long as I can. Then, But on the inpatient side, meaning someone's very sick in the ICU, I may start early just to clean the blood early and not wait till the kidneys are all jacked up. So it depends on the individual nephrologist and the individual treatment sometimes. So, Well, I'm glad I waited because otherwise yeah. I'd be going into dialysis multiple times a week or doing it here at home. Now, well, it depends. Did you, you got fluids and everything. It got better. No, did, you got fluids. Did it get better in the hospital when you got it? I I got. I started feeling much better. I was still pretty okay. bad. I think when my I left, my BUN was around sixty, uh, but it yeah. came way down. It was well over a hundred. Um, mm. My creatinine had slowly gone down, so that I got to GFR thirteen. Of course, mm-hmm. I didn't understand what any of these numbers meant. I remember. I clearly remember when the doctor came in and said, your GFR looks like it's stabilized at 13. I'm like, oh, awesome, great. Does that mean I'm going to get better? Yeah. And that yeah. just meant well, you know, that was as good as it thought setting, it would get James, right there. Y- even in your setting, you could have done, you know, I'm not saying you would, I'm not Monday morning quarterbacking the situation, mm-hmm. but you could have done dialysis a few times, maybe three or four times, and just got your blood cleaned and then just watched it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, there's just multiple approaches here. It's not like one formula fits everybody. So, you know, I've gotten those people where it's like, I've never seen a doctor and my GFR is five. You know, I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, you know, so, you know, and, you know, you maybe do dial in, in the inpatient setting, in the hospital setting, you may just do dialysis a few days, clean out their blood, make them feel a little better, then kind of rest it out and see where their yep. kidney function, their creatinine levels off. So. So, so that answers one of my questions was, can this access be temporary? And you did mention that there's temporary and permanent More permanent. versions. Yeah. So there's like the Quinton cat, well, let's call it a non-tunnel dialysis catheter, which is coming out the internal jugular vein directly like this. And it's typically sutured here or here. So it's coming out right here and you can visibly see it coming out right here. Now that you have the, what we call the permacath, which is a tunnel dialysis catheter, which is going in the same vein, guys. It's going in that vein, but it's actually tunneled out the skin. So it comes out right here in the chest. So it's tunneled up this way, going into this vein, but this part here is just sutured closed. So that's the more permanent, uh, a permanent access, a permanent catheter that can be left in for probably months. Whereas uh, the the, temp- the temporary catheter, the tunnel cat- non-tunnel catheter can be left in for like seven to 14 days typically. So, Cool. So if yeah. I'm in there and the doctors tell me, look, you're, you need dialysis now, are there decisions that I need to make? Are there certain things that I can make decisions on and what are they? Uh, decisions they as far as if you want to... Uh, I, know, I mean, any, I have no clue. Do I get to choose which side, right or left? I, do I get no, any decisions? I mean, I mean, I guess you could. I mean, guess you could. But <laughs> typically, we like to go on the right side just because the anatomy is easier. The anatomy here mm-hmm. just goes straight down, so it's easier. It's just straightforward. Um, you know, uh, you, I, you always have a choice. I want you guys to ever know you always have a choice. You even have the right to refuse dialysis. You really do. There's no way I can make you do dialysis. Um, especially when they get older, these patients get older and they're like 70, 80, 90. And they're like, I've lived a long life. I don't want dialysis. I totally respect it. So you have to, so you guys always have a choice.
to refuse anything. But I, what I would do is, you know, do what you guys are doing now. Get educated. So when the doctor's mm-hmm. saying you need urgent dialysis, ask them why I need urgent dialysis. Is there any medication I can take to clean it out? Do I have to have it? Um, uh, can we wait a day or two? Um, things like that, right? But if you're like, let's just say this, you're not making any urine, you're in the ER and you're not making any urine or, you know, not making any urine and you're short of breath, guess what? You need some dialysis to get that fluid off of you because you're not going to urinate that fluid off. Do you see what I'm saying? Yep. So it's, 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 it's a, it's a case by case basis. So you guys have to be, um, uh, careful, um, but also, you know, be open-minded to th- some ideas and things like that, but also do what James did, you know, like just be educated and say, Hey, maybe we can hold off. Maybe we can't blah, blah, blah. Um, well, I'll tell you, I was think- begging. I was like, look doc. I was like bartering. I was still producing yeah. urine though. Not as much as I normally did. Yeah. Um, and I was like, Doc, I just need I just need another day. I got to do some research. Give me the internet and give me a day. Can you do that? And we would, yeah, I, I would kind of barter that. And then I got a day. And then after maybe three or four days in the ICU, we came to the agreement, look, I'm going to, I am going to change my diet. I will never drink another Dr. Pepper again. And that's all I yeah. drank. There was no water in my life. It was in the Dr. Yeah. Pepper. I was like, no, Dr. Pepper, I'm not ordering from fast food. I'm going to learn how to cook. I'm going to eat right. I'm going to yeah. adjust my medications for my blood pressure, get it where it needs to be. I'm going to keep it there. I'll take my blood pressure as often as I need. I was committed to make whatever changes were necessary right then and there. And that's yeah. why and she agreed. She said, okay, well, here's what you're going to do. You're going to come into the hospital every day. Mm-hmm. For the next week, we're going to take your labs every day and we're going to keep an eye on them. If you're doing good and you're holding steady and the other things are improving, and I didn't understand everything at that point, you can stay off. But if your GFR gets back down to 10, you're coming in, you're going on dialysis. And Mm -hmm. they even talked about putting a port in so they could heal. And I was like, no, 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 no. I am going to change. I'm not going to need dialysis. I was determined 100 percent even though that doesn't determine it i was going to give it my best effort and it worked well yeah giving it yeah but you just gave more than probably 80 to 90 percent of my patients do you see what i'm saying so it's a hard those are changes that we i wish my patients could make and improve their quality of life and improve their outcomes um but you know you have to face death to make those changes that's what it was for me i'm sitting there thinking i can't die and leave my kids and my wife. Uh, I, if I went on dialysis, my job, I couldn't do that. I couldn't travel. I was always traveling before COVID. I was yeah. very active yeah. all over the place. So I was looking at a life altering event. And so yeah. there's like, there's nothing that I won't try to try to avoid that. I'm going to get back yeah. on the, the good track. So, you know, besides your incident, like, so I would say there's other ways we can, you know, um, approach this whole thing. Like, I think we can approach it from those, like the emergency, sometimes you can't avoid them. Meaning you get really sick, you get what we call septic, you get, you know, ingested medication or ingested toxin or something like that. Those are things you can't take. But if you guys out there have CKD, particularly if you have less, you know, CKD4, you know, sometimes emergent dialysis may be needed. For certain things and one of the biggest things i've noticed is these patients oftentimes develop what we call fluid overload right so they get overloaded mm-hmm. they get too much swelling too much shortness of breath and the, the biggest problem occurs is because patients do not get to their doctor quick enough right they don't want to go see their doctor so they wait the next week or two weeks or three weeks and by that time they have the cankles right i've seen yeah. legs huge like gigantic oh, and by that time it's very hard i couldn't to fight wear it. my jeans my jeans would not fit yeah you what know, what the I'm trying to say just, is, like, my I've legs seen, are just too big yeah. for them. Yeah, and even then, like, if you get short of breath and everything, so one of the biggest indications I've seen for emergent or urgent dialysis is patients with fluid overload syndrome. So you, as a kidney disease patient, you need to be aware of swelling happening in your legs or the fact that you're getting short of breath. And you know, if you're and like, oftentimes I'm following my patients uh, if they're CKD four three every three months or so, maybe every two months. But I tell my patients, don't wait to two to three months if you're having issues. Right? Don't say, oh, my appointment's in May, I'll go see him then, and I'm short of breath or my swelling. Don't wait till that time because 
because then so much fluid accumulates, right? And things can yeah. happen. So for those of you guys that are late stage CKD fours and fives, you have to be, co uh, you know, a, a co coherent of the fact that you guys have late stage kidney disease and that swelling can develop or shortness of breath can develop. And we don't want you sending to the ERs, guys. ER ERs and hospitalizations cost America. American taxpayer and American medicine so much money because spending the nights in hospitals is so expensive. So rather, it's oh, yeah. good to have a good relationship with a PCP or a um, nephrologist, a kidney doctor, and that way you can say, hey, God, hey, Dr. Bud, I'm feeling kind of short of breath. Should I up my Lasix or my diuretics and see if that helps? You know, that, that oftentimes can prevent a hospitalization, prevent a dialysis and things like that as well too. So Yeah, my seven days in the ICU, the bill itself was just shy of a quarter million dollars, which I was like, wow. what the heck? Um, wow. I don't know what insurance paid, but it ended up costing me like a like a good used car. I probably paid yeah. like eight or nine thousand dollars out of pocket um, yeah. just for that hospital stay. And it was right at the very end of the year. So yeah. all my co-pays reset a month later. It was like, oh, a double whammy. Oh, wow. Yeah, my wow, company has sucks. has good insurance, but it hurts to use it. It's like the, oh, the, right? the more you need it, the better it is. But if you just need a little bit, it's not. Yeah, yeah. It hurts. I totally see what you're saying, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, again, from the kidney, kidney disease standpoint, those of you kidney disease, be, be cognizant of the fact that you have swelling be, you know, be aware of it, maybe press on your legs. And the way you can tell, guys, is to just press on the leg. And if you see an indentation there, that's called edema, pitted edema. And so if it's accumulating, getting bigger, um, don't be afraid to uh, call your nephrologist or whatever to get in a little bit earlier, check your kidney function and things like that. So, And what you just mentioned was one thing that was shocking to me to realize by seeing it in, in person my thoughts when they when i saw my legs were so swollen i thought and they said it was fluid i thought oh i would push it, it would just bounce right back out it would just be real squishy but that's not what it was i could push remove my fingers and the indentation was still there and yeah. i remember yeah. sleeping with my legs kind of crossed and that big giant indentation was on my leg it felt like for the rest of the day it was there yeah. Um, yeah. It's crazy, dude. Yeah. It's crazy to, just to see it happen. You have to remember, yeah. um, you know, people happen to think that, oh, I can drink more water. My kidneys will get better. It's not necessarily the case, guys. So when you have swelling in your legs or fluid in your fluid in your lungs, that's actually water. So um, I like myself and even uh, James at his state, you know, if we drink a lot of water, we just pee it right out. No problem, no problem. But late stage kidney disease, when you're four and five, oftentimes you can't excrete all the water and it accumulates in your legs and it accumulates in your lungs. So you guys have to be careful out there when you're trying to drink too much, uh, if you're drinking too much water, so. Yeah, so let's say I'm in the ER. They've mm -hmm. installed a port. Yeah. <laughs> like, like it's a computer. They installed a port. Yeah. Um, I'm on dialysis. My drinking and eating, I'm assuming that has to change right then and there because fluids got to be. Yeah, so they'll put better. you. If you're, it depends on why, why you're getting the emergent dialysis. So if you're getting the dialysis for a high potassium, guess what, guys? They're going to put you on a renal diet or low potassium diet while you're in the hospital. And if you're getting it because of uh, fluid overload, yeah, you're going to be on what we call a fluid restriction. Maybe you're only allowed to drink a liter or a liter and a half a day or something like that. So it depends on. Um, the reason why you've been in there. Remember, there's no one reason for emergent urgent dialysis. It's multifaceted. Again, like different things can cause it. Um, and there's, and again, if it's emergent urgent and you're not a dialysis patient, there's a chance you could recover. There is a chance mm -hmm. um, that you could recover. So, um, you know, depending on what the cause was. So, um, you know, be, be aware of that. Again, if you are, if you are those type of people get submitted to the hospital, ask them what their creatinine is. How's it, how's the GFR doing? How much urine am I making? Keep involved. Um, when you're in hospitalized, like, so like you were James, right? You had nothing to do, like literally nothing to do. You have 24 nothing. hours. And no that. one can really visit you. First time in the ICU. So yeah. there's limited visiting hours. There's no kids allowed. Yeah. No yeah, one's yeah. sick or even Which is not a bad sick. thing. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. it was, it was very odd. It was very lonely, but luckily I'm such a nerd. I was like, I had my computer. I Amazoned a printer, a laser printer. And mm -hmm. a box of paper, not a ream, a box of paper and all these highlighters. And I just had like a workstation at my bed 
with all these cables. And whenever I had to go to the restroom, oh, it was a pain. Hitting the nurse button. I had to wait for the nurse. Get all my stuff off of me. And then they would unhook some equipment. And then rest, I would pull along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just researched. I taught (laughs) myself. I used it to educate myself. I wish the hospitals, though, had videos like this where there were nephrologists explaining, what is GFR? What is creatinine? What do my labs mean? I wish that was there. So I just was taking printouts that they would make copies of for me because I would ask. And I was Googling and looking up. And, of course, Google is 90% scary wrong stuff. But I was looking really hard for that 10% good stuff. Yeah, and, and what, what James was doing, guys, I think like if you do that, do it with reputable websites, right? The WebMDs, the Mayo Clinics, um, different uh, the National Kidney Foundation website. Use use legit websites when you're getting trying to get real information. Um, mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, my, I would say my videos are good as well too. But there are some doctors out there that do some more alternative stuff that's not within the realm of traditional medicine. It may not necessarily be wrong, but it may not necessarily be right, right? So there's no guidance for that. So especially if you're in that weird phase where your kidneys are declining or something, you may want to stick to more traditional stuff just to make sure it it works right. So um, then the other other one I would address is not just the kidney disease patients like the CKDs and fours and fives, but those are, I'm pretty sure you have an audience out there that's on dialysis, right? Oh yeah, yeah. some of them are already on dialysis. Yeah, so some so those guys, guess what? They need emergent dialysis too. You know, they can have issues develop. And a lot of times I've noticed is though the people that do need it developed are those that are what we call non compliant. Don't follow the rules, don't follow the dialysis. So there's actually a lot of people out there that miss dialysis, guys. They miss oh. dialysis. You're supposed to get it three times a week. But some of them come in through twice a week, once a week. Sometimes they skip for weeks at a time. And guess what? What happens when they do that? The toxins build up, the fluid builds up, and all of a sudden they show up in the ER at two in the morning, and I gotta get called out of bed because, you know, they're they're in the ER, you know, co- what we call coding or you know, on the respirator or whatever it is, yeah. you know. So mm. the the compliance is key. So if those of you guys are on dialysis, I know you guys may feel fine, you know, um, even without dialysis for a few days, but it's not right. Right. In the sense that, you, you know, your kidneys right now or my kidneys and James kidneys are working 24 seven. Right. So when you're on dialysis, you're getting it four times a day, three times a week. Right. Four, four, three times a week, four times, four hours each session. Right. So you're giving me 12 hours of cleaning time versus 24 seven of cleaning yeah. time. Oof. Right. So. Um, when you guys miss sessions, it's actually very dangerous out there for uh, for you people on dialysis because one, your potassium can go sky high. Your kidneys aren't working, so there's no way to get rid of that potassium, right? Mm-hmm. So your ki- potassium can go sky high, which can kill you. Remember, the first sign of really high potassium is death, okay? There's no other signs. You won't know how your potassium is high. The first sign is what we call it was death. Yeah, and that, that's, what, that's a kick- symptom we don't want. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's a sucky <laughs> symptom. It's a really yeah, bad symptom. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, so your heart stops, right? So, um, uh, you know, other acid levels can build up. Uremia can build up, meaning if you don't get enough dialysis, your blood's not getting clean. You start feeling weak, tired. But the another, one of the most common reasons they come in is because of what we call fluid overload. They drink too much water, drink too much fluids in between di- sessions. So in general, guys, if you guys are on dialysis, you should drink about two to three liters in between dialysis sessions. Two to three liters in between. Um, and not try to overdo it more than that because that puts a lot of strain on your heart, but also can put you into what we call pulmonary edema, where all of a sudden the the fluid is rushed to your lungs and you get short of breath. And then you have to get emergency dialysis at that point. So, yeah. Now, if I go in and they need to do dialysis now, can I later switch to like home dialysis and get Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, like you have to be assessed. So again, if you're emergent dialysis, they have to assess you. They'd probably do a dialysis for a day, two, three days, and then reassess you and see, hey, is everything better? The electrolytes better? Fluid situation better? Is this creatinine? Is GFR kind of leveling off now? Meaning it's staying around 20, dude. It's okay. You can maybe keep them off dialysis. And then um, you can decide that. But if it doesn't recover, let's just say it doesn't recover, then you probably switch, switch to the, the chronic setting, okay? Meaning they'll say, you know what? Maybe he needs dialysis a few more days or a few more weeks. Sometimes, guys, kidney injury, 
when you have kidney injury, and there's two types of kidney injury, right? There's acute and there's chronic. So chronic is when you have diabetes for 30, 40 years, and that GFR is just slowly declining. Your kidney is getting scarred and scarred, and guess what? You're on dialysis permanently, right? Then you have what we call acute kidney injury, and that, that's a reason for emergent dialysis is acute kidney injury for various reasons. But if it's acute, meaning it's relatively normal, GFR is like 60, 70, whatever it is, and then suddenly drops for whatever reason. Say you get no, pneumonia or get COVID or something like that. Mm -hmm. Your GFR drops. Well, guess what? The, when your GFR drops like that and you, the kidneys are insulted, sometimes it takes a few days, sometimes it takes a few weeks, and sometimes it takes a few months for your kidneys to wake up. So maybe you need dialysis for a few days, a few weeks, or a few months until your kidneys actually wake up. You see what I'm saying? So yep. you may need dialysis temporarily. Now, typically when they go from the inpatient setting, uh, like inpatient in the hospital setting, if you're in the hospital, they're probably going to transition you to um, uh, in-center dialysis, in-center hemodialysis. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's probably going to be your first choice out. And the reason why is because if you're in the hospital and you just started dialysis uh, emergently, um, you haven't had any training on home dialysis. You haven't had the home visit to make sure everything's right. okay at home. You haven't had all that other stuff done. Um, you don't, they haven't assessed your home situation, your, your family situation, your cleanliness, all those other things that your electric, electric power, your water power, all this other stuff, the water power, but water, <laughs> water, uh, water, you know, water stuff. Um, and, um, so they're probably going to start you on in-center hemodialysis for the first few weeks and then let you transition to their home therapies program. But again, anybody out here that's late state kidney disease, this is a side note, James, you guys really need to inquire about home dialysis, dialysis at home. Please inquire about it because if you're close to it, it's going to improve your quality of life. It may seem daunting. It may seem overwhelming, but it's really not. And it gives you such a better quality of life. So you, there's, you can do the dialysis at home. And you can go back and watch one of James's shows when we talked about dialysis at home and yep. get the details of it. But yeah. Yeah. Natalie says her machine walks her through every step of the the process oh dude it's it's a joke not a joke it's easy like the the, the machines are like ipads they have like yep. essentially ipads on them and um they talk you through every step and the, that's the peritoneal dialysis even the bags that you put on that machine are color-coded and so um and a nurse support 24 7 i mean it's not like you're alone it's like it's not like you're alone it, it and again if you guys start home dialysis and you hate it after a few weeks go back to in center dude go back but Give it a try. I'm telling you, everyone out there, try home if you can. And you know what's weird, James? So I was talking about the compliant huh. patients, the ones that don't have, aren't, aren't compliant with dialysis. They suck at it. Or they, they don't follow directions. They don't come to sessions. Some of them actually do better at home. Because they just hate the life of going in center. Ah. And you put them in a home dialysis setting, you, you just give that person a second chance or a third chance or whatever chance you want to give them yep. and say, hey, try this at home. All of a sudden, their compliance goes up. Their numbers get better. Their, their mood gets better. Their Everything gets better. So well, home it looks happens. so much more convenient, especially for me. If, if I needed dialysis, I would definitely get set up for home. First of all, I like to sleep in. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I want to do it on my schedule. <laughs> <clears throat> mm -hmm. and I like the idea of doing it every night because my kidneys now 24 seven, they're working, they're doing what they can. Um, the idea of going to just four hours, three days a week. Ah, that, yeah. And know, that's, that's why those in center. Yeah. That's why those feel, in center people feel drained because within that four hour session, the, the, the kid, the Dallas machine is trying to do two days worth of work. Right. Exactly. And so it's trying to do two days. It's trying to pull off two days worth of fluid. It's trying to pull off two days worth of toxins. And so you're drained because the, the kidney, that, not all, not everyone's drained, but a large percentage of people or a significant percentage of people are drained, especially the elderly. They feel tired. They want to go home and take a nap because it's so drained. Yeah, not if head to work. Yeah. And so <laughs> and if you're doing a home H, uh, peritoneal dialysis, which is every night, you're getting blood cleaned every night. Mm -hmm. You're doing home hemodialysis. You're doing it five days a week, two and a half hours each session, somewhere around there, um, you know, um, and you're getting clean virtually every day. So you're feeling relatively like a normal person and your diet's lit up. So again, everywhere out there, late state kidney disease, make sure you ask about your, ask your nephrologist about home therapies. If your GFR is less than 30 guys, anybody there with GFR less than 30, start asking about dialysis. Start asking about home dialysis in particular and see how it can be done. Get educated, like do what James did, get educated about it. And yeah, that, that's why you're here talking about it. So we can learn yeah. as much as possible so that yeah. if the day comes, we yep. have some awareness. At least we're like, okay, yeah, now I know you're going to put it in my neck. It's not permanent. 
I can then switch to something else if I need to. I know why. Uh, may not remember yeah, all yeah, the reasons, but we're, we'll remember A E I O U. I'm sure of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so now we did have a good question here from Jane and Bill. Um, do you recommend or do you suggest hemo or PD as being the easiest for home dialysis? Ooh. Okay, so uh, as far as PD or home he home hemo, I think it's really about personal choice. Okay. So, um, let me get, let me go over again. So hemodialysis requires an axis in the arm, either here or here. Okay. Sorry. Here or, or here, right. It requires an axis in the arm. It's your, it's a vein. It's either going to be a fistula or a graft. And if, in, in order to get access to that, uh, to that blood in that graft, you're going to have to either cannulate yourself, stick yourself or get a spouse or family member to stick it for you. Okay. So if you're not good with needles, all right. If you don't like needles or your family member doesn't like needles and don't like the idea of sticking you, home hemodialysis may not be the best for you. Okay. Um, the, um, if you don't like getting an access in the arm, a surgery in the arm, right? You don't want a surgery in the arm, then maybe home. Can you hear me, James? Yep. 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 Oh yeah. Sorry. I, I thought you cut out. Um, anyway, so if you don't like getting an access in your arm, having one of those fistulas or grafts in your arm, maybe home hemodialysis isn't for you. Now, if, um, if you're alone and you don't have support, now some people can do home hemodialysis by themselves. It's some of the machines allow you to, and some nephrologists allow you to, but if you, you don't want the blood, you don't want the needles, you don't want the access, you can do something called peritoneal dialysis PD, which is a tube in the abdomen. Okay. The tube in the abdomen is nice because, um, there's no blood, no needles, nothing like that. All you're doing is putting a, a bag of fluid in a bag of fluid out. Now you can do it manually where it's just exchanges where bags of fluids go in, bags of fluids go out, probably four times, four exchanges a day, four to five exchanges a day like that. Or you can do it um, at night while you sleep. So you do it, you just connect yourself to a machine at night. It's like the size of a VCR. You put some yep. bags of fluids on there and you just put plug it in there. You from 10 a.m. to whatever, 6 a.m. You're just on this machine. And That's the, the one I would do. I don't out. like needles so, and I like mm -hmm. the way that sounds. While let's I'm just say, let's just say, God forbid, I was, I would probably pick PD. And to be honest with you, I'd probably pick that. It's because I wouldn't want that access to my arm until later. Um, you know, because you, there's a lifespan to PD too. Sometimes some people can do it for a decade. Some people can do it for a few years and the exchanges don't work anymore. Then eventually you have to go to the arm. Now I'm actually an interventionalist. So I actually see these people's veins, right? So these veins that we're talking about, the fistulas and the grafts, um, they only last for so long. Right, a graft's average lifespan is about two years. Of fish still five, six, seven years. So, if you're a, a young person going on dialysis, say forty years old, you may live twenty years, right? And so, you may go from access here to access here. Oh, then we gotta go access over here, then access over here. You may run out of vein real estate. Do you see what I'm saying? So, yep. you may run out of real estate. So, um, I would ideally start PD. I think we should be a PD first nation, um, and meaning go go for that modality first um, as a whole. Um, and it, I think it's just nicer, gentler. I think more people can do it. It's, it's really relatively straightforward and then go to hemodialysis as a secondary option. So awesome. All right. We have covered so much information today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We went everywhere. Yeah. Let's see if there's any questions anyone has that's related to our topic. Um, mm -hmm. we can't give any specifics for anyone. If someone's asking, Hey, can I take this medication? Should I be doing this? How much of that? Those are questions for your healthcare team who knows your health in your labs. But let's see if anyone has it. Yeah, here we go. Is PD as efficient as hemo in cleaning the blood? Uh, yeah, I did. Again, it's, it's interesting. So it's, it depends on your peritoneum, the inner lining of your gut area where the, the, the exchanges happen. Some people have good uh, good at clean, good cleaning. Some people have less. Some people need different prescriptions to make that 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 it more efficient. But yes, you can't have it just as efficient cleaning of the blood. Cleaning of the blood. You know, again, there's no direct blood to blood contact here, right? There's no here, but you can cleaning of the blood just as efficiently. The other good thing about PD too is. Um, it's really good for people that have what we call residual kidney function. If you have residual kidney function, meaning you're still urinating, let's just say you're still making a liter yeah, or two yeah. urine a day. It's actually maintains that ability to do that better than say hemodialysis, especially in center, because they're oftentimes trying to pull off fluid to a certain amount. You see what I'm saying? Whereas yep. PD, you put those exchanges in and you can, you can pull off fluid, but it's not as, it's not as, 
you see what I'm doing, right? Yep, yep, that that yep. gesture. It's not. <laughs> I'm trying to put a word to it. It's not yanking it out of you. You see what I'm saying? It's just kind of gently taking it off. So it yeah, and that's, preserves that's, residual. It's better on your heart too, right? When you're doing yeah, that. again, the gentler the removal of the fluid, the the more easier it is on you. Now the home hemo is gentle too, so you don't have to remove as much fluid. So I'm not negating that, but in general, PD is good for those with what we call residual kidney function because it keeps that residual kidney function going. So even if you have a GFR of say eight to ten, but you need dialysis, it'll keep that eight to ten going longer than say in center hemodialysis. Now Ray over in London asked this question. Mm -hmm. Uh, does peritoneal eventually stop working? Yeah, yeah. So it, it does. Like like I was saying, you have these exchanges. Again, it's reliant on the membranes that surround your organs, right? So it, you put the fluid in the in the cavity, which is like you know a compartment, and that fluid it does exchanges over the the membrane. So it can over time stop working the the um the, the efficiency of how well it cleans can go away over time and it, it and it can it's it's not like it can't but you know starting with it and doing it for a few years is probably a good idea because oftentimes if you do it for a few years and let's say you're relatively young and healthy you can get a transplant in between then you see what i'm saying so um it's cool if you're really aggressive about getting a kidney transplant or really on it. Can I make a side note about the transplant thing, guys? Yeah, 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 sure. I really want patients out there to be more aggressive about getting kidney transplants and asking their kidney doctors about it. Now, not everyone qualifies, okay? So don't, don't think you're out there, everyone gets a kidney. Hey, give me a kidney, give me a kidney. You know, you have to qualify, meaning you have to get screened. Well, well first thing you do, you're gonna ask about the kidney transplant, you can get referred to a transplant center. You're gonna get the transplant center to tell you no, or yes or no. Okay, that's how you're gonna get it. Okay, now if you're non-compliant with dialysis, they're probably not gonna send you. Okay, <laughs> you have to show that you are compliant. But I would definitely um, ask them to refer your transplant center, have them evaluate you, make sure you're healthy. You have to have good heart, meaning you know no heart disease. You have to have no cancers, um, a lot of other things, and you have to be a good candidate overall. And they'll then you can be put on the transplant list. So be aggressive and assertive about that. Be make sure you reach out to the transplant center. Make sure you get all the workup done, and bug them every few months saying, "Hey, I'm on the transplant list. Anything I need to be done? Anything I need to be done?" And yep. I, it's kind of funny. It's my channel, your kidneys, your health. But that's what I that's my mantra. Like I really believe it's your kidneys, your health. So you yep. guys have to take a charge of it. So. And another reason to to reach out earlier to a transplant center is there's a BMI requirement and you may need mm -hmm. to lose a sizable amount of weight. And if you find out mm -hmm. earlier, you can start working on that. And that could be motivation to keep you focused on losing weight. I think absolutely. And that's, that, that's one of my biggest frustrations, uh, James, is that uh, there's a lot of patients I have that are just really good people, really nice people, but they're too damn big, right? They're like yep. BMI is above 35. And no surgeon is going to touch them because there are complications that develop afterwards and other things as well. So, you know, it's frustrating. It's really frustrating because a lot of these patients are good candidates, good people, follow their instructions, do all that stuff, but they're so big. And, you know, um, you know, and they don't have good instruction about how to lose weight or they don't have the motivation, say, like you did to lose the weight. Um, but, yeah, uh, getting a kidney transplant is uh, can be negated if you don't. So getting working on early and then following up with those that transplant center to make sure you can get back on it. That's really crucial as well too. Yeah, and I did really well in the beginning losing. I lost so much weight. But since COVID, a lot of it has found its way back. <laughs> oh so yeah, I'm, I'm just getting back on my healthy kick in the last two, three weeks and I feel great I am, now. Yes, like, I God. am refocused on being healthy. As a matter yeah. of fact, I was talking to um, uh, Jen Hernandez, a renal dietitian last night that I went for a jog. I, I decided, you know what? I'm just gonna go for a jog outside. I went for a jog and my watch, my Apple watch gave me this weird alert about my heart. And I thought, uh-oh, something's, something's wrong. And it told me to look on the phone. I went to the phone and it was just pretty much saying, hey, you haven't done this much activity in three months. Is everything okay? It was just confirming that I was exercising because I had not pushed myself that far in the last three months. And that was kind wow, of an eye opener wow. to me. Like, holy cow, I've with winter, the cold, the ice, the snow and all that. Yeah. I, oh, I stopped my walking 
I do a little bit here in the house on the treadmill that I got from my wife for Christmas that only I use. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> it was for me, but disguised as a gift for her. Yeah. Uh, but today I was out walking twice, two miles already. Earlier, I'm like, I'm going to fix this trend. I'm going to get my weight back under control because it's good for my body. And if I do need a transplant or if I get to the point where, you know, I need one, I want to qualify. And yeah. I needed that and motivation. Those of you guys, and those of you guys, too, if you guys are, um, if your GFR is less than 20 or 20 or less, you guys ask to be referred to a transplant center. Ask them to refer to a transplant center. And unfortunately, not all of us live in big cities like me and James do. So you live in rural centers. So it's, it's crucial you get that referral early. That way you get on the list to get worked up. And, you know, there, there are indica- there are some issues. Uh, people that do get preemptive transplants, meaning before mm-hmm. they need dialysis, they get a transplant and it could be from a living donor. I, I think very rarely from a cadaveric donor, cause it's usually the wait time is three to five years. So yeah. if you could survive with GFR of 18 for, <laughs> for like five years, that's amazing. But you know, if you get a if you get a, you have a living donor available, that's always good as well too. Yep. And as our last question of the night is gets to be Judith here. She asked, is there an age cutoff for a transplant? Uh, okay. So not necessarily. Yes and no. Yes and no. So typically if you're above 65, you gotta remember a transplant situation is a tree, almost like a triage situation, right? Meaning it's not just anybody can get a transplant. You have to qualify, right? So I just want you to think about this. If you're 75 years old, you know, is it worth putting a, a kidney transplant in you, that kidney in you at 75 or that other person at 45? Do you see what I'm saying? That yeah. it's like, you want to give the the longest life to the long to the person that's going to live the longest, right? Um, now, this is what they'll do. So, sixty five and over, oftentimes they'll value you and say, "Hey, you're healthy. You're relatively healthy. Um, maybe you don't qualify for a cadaver kidney, uh, meaning someone passing away, like in a car accident, you getting it. But perhaps you're good, enough, you're healthy enough to where if you have someone in your family or friend that wants to donate to you, we'll do it. You see what I'm saying? So they'll be like, okay go for it. You know, you, you're, you're, you're good. You got the green light, but you got to find the kidney. You see what I'm saying? So that's yep. where some of the trouble sometimes goes. It's not, an, you know, I can't, I think it's about 65 or so where they say that's where not, not a cutoff is, but, um, generally, yeah, that around there, it's not like you don't transfer, but you won't transfer, you won't qualify without a living donor at that point. So yeah, makes sense. All right, doc, thank yeah. you so much for helping enlighten us so much about dialysis and all this. Um, I even learned quite a bit. Every show, I learned something. People out there, they think, Mm -hmm. many of them told me, they say, you know all this stuff. Like, no, I don't. I'm taking the ride with all of you guys learning along the way. And I'd like to thank everyone for being here tonight. Make sure and check out Dr. Butt's YouTube channel, Your Health, Your Kidneys, or did I reverse it? Your kidneys, your health. So. Your kidneys, your health. <laughs> oh, 50 50 chance of getting it. Yeah. And his Facebook page. And keep an eye out for his videos that he posts out there. They're great. They're short. They're educational and entertaining. All right, everybody. All right. This is the last video of the week. I'll see all of you next week in the next video. Bye, everyone. <laughs>